Hi, everybody. My name is Al Sanarega. I'm from the Bronxville Paranormal Society. And my paranormal uh, experience happened on October, Friday the 13th. I went out with my cousin, Sean, to a place I call the Sacred Site. Typically, it's um, Squatch related, you know, old Bigfoot stuff. But this particular night was going to be different. There was going to be a solar eclipse during the day and uh, 1% of the moon that night. Uh, this was Sean's very first time out ever doing paranormal investigating. So he was really excited. So I called my psychic Cindy beforehand and we were talking with Cindy and Cindy said that the veil that night was going to be very thin. Cindy also went on to tell us that we were going to encounter a 10 foot tall creature that looked like a bear. She called it a bear squatch. I kind of referred to it as a gugway, but she said it was from a different realm and was very dangerous. We needed to be careful. She also went on to say that um, she sees fairies at the location, but she doesn't believe that they were actually fairies. She thought they were trickster beings. So we hike out to the location. My cousin Sean and I, we get there and we call Cindy up just to validate everything, you know, talk to her again because she likes to us to call us when we're actually at the sacred site. And she goes on to tell my cousin, that A, he's very sensitive, and B, he's a part Native American, which he is. And he, I didn't know how sensitive he was at the time, but I uh, come to find out that he is very sensitive. She also went on to claim that I was part Native American. And here, Cindy and I got into a little bit of an argument, and we argue all the time. I've been dealing with her for a dozen years or so. And she kept telling me that she's seen Native American blood in mine. And I kept telling her that, no, I'm 100% Italian. And, and she kept saying, nope, she sees Native American blood with mine. And then a little light bulb goes on on the back of my head. And I remember in my late teens, 19, 20 years old, one of my best friends was half Apache. And we did a blood brother ritual where we actually sliced our hands and mingled our blood and she said that was what she was probably seeing which totally blew my mind and totally blew my cousin's mind so then we finished this talking with her for that time and i decided to start setting up so I, I set up different color glow sticks around us in a horseshoe shape different colors all around us and right next to a couple of the glow sticks i put a couple of k2 meters to see if the meters would go off. And um, in front of us, I put orange glow sticks for ambient light. But we did have very powerful headlamps. They were 700 lumas. They went from uh, a flood to a spot. So we had very powerful headlamps that night because there was only going to be 1% of the moon. So I made sure that we had like really powerful headlamps. So time went on and we had... Uh, one of the digital voice recorders, which was voice activated, refused to go on. No matter what, it worked perfect at the house. But when I got to the location, it refused to go on. But the other recorder, which ran continuously for 72 hours, which we put behind us, actually was running the whole time we were there. So as time went gone on, it was around dusk, just before it got dark. We heard it would sound like a Black Hawk helicopter hovering over us. Now, there was only a small opening in the tree canopy that you could look up at and see, even though there were really no leaves on the tree because it was Friday the 13th. It was, you know, mid-October, but we couldn't see it. Whatever this helicopter was, to us, it was invisible. We couldn't see it. We could hear the blades. We could feel the percussion of the blades, but we couldn't see the helicopter. We thought that was absolutely insane. So as night went on, my cousin decided to do a whoop. Now, according to our psychic, the Bigfoots weren't there that night because of the thinning of the veil and all the other entities that were going to be coming through. 
But my cousin decided to do a whoop, and he did an amazing whoop, just absolutely amazing. And then from the east side of the lake, we heard a whoop come back to us. Now, the east side of these woods is what I refer to as the dog man side of the woods. But we heard a very powerful whoop from about two miles away on the other side of the lake. And then this particular whoop started to move to our north. Every three seconds, this creature would whoop. But every time it whooped, it was further and further away. Like it went from being three miles away to being a hundred yards behind us in three seconds, which is un unfathomable. This, how could this happen? My cousin is like, how, can they move that fast? Is this possible? And I said, I know this is going to sound crazy, but the only way these creatures can move that fast is if they're jumping through portals, different dimensions. And this happened three different times as they went from, it went from a hundred yards behind us to like a half a mile to a mile to a mile and a half was, at, and in the whoops, you could hear the whoops loud and clear, but they were getting further and further away, which was, you know, just totally mind blowing. So then we, everything kind of settled down. It got dark and everything kind of settled down and. My cousin turned to me and he said, man, these woods are devoid of life. We're four miles in deep into the woods. There's a 52 acre lake to our east, which is about maybe a mile away from us. There were no ducks in the lake. There were no geese in the lake. There were no crickets. There were no tree frogs. There was no or raccoons or possums, not even any mice running around. It was just like we were in a void. And I turned to my cousin and I was like, I feel like we're in a black void and we're inside a glass dome. And my cousin almost fell off his chair because he said, Al, I feel the same way. I feel like we're in a glass dome looking out into a black void. And I said, it just doesn't make any sense. So at this point, I decided to start breaking out my equipment. I have 250 different environmental readings that I like to do when I go out. So I started with the basic readings to get a flat line reading of the area. And to my surprise, every single reading was flat lined. I got no readings on any of my instruments, which doesn't make any kind of sense. There's always energy all around us in the environment. Everywhere there's energy, and you should be able to read this energy with certain tools. So then I always like to go old school, new school, ITC devices, and with old school stuff like uh, military-grade compasses, copper dowsing rods, crystal pendulums, old school stuff like that. And... um Normally, if one is not picking up something, the other is. This particular night, no matter what we did, whether it was old school or new school, nothing. Was, we got no readings with anything we did, which, again, makes no kind of sense. So then I says to my cousin, I started, you know, I'm teaching my cousin all the tricks of the trade. And I'm like, okay. We're going to play with a couple of different things that usually change the environmental readings after we do them. So the first thing I did was I broke out a recording of a Native American drum ceremony, but not just any ceremony. This was a shaman ceremony, and I truly expected the readings to jump off the charts after I played this ceremony. And after I played that ceremony, everything still was flatlined, which made 
no sense. I've never played that ceremony before and not have the environmental energy change all around me. So my cousin just looks at me like, what's going on? I said, I don't know. I have another little trick I like to play with. So I broke out some incense. I use particular incense to draw Bigfoots in. I know of a couple of different things that they really love. And even though the psychic said there weren't going to be any there, I wanted to put this fragrance and this aroma out into the woods to see what would come in. So I did this. I burnt the incense. I let them all burn down. Uh, we waited a half hour or so, broke out all the instruments again. We weren't seeing anything around us. But again, all the instruments flatlined. Old school, new school, it didn't matter. We had no energy coming in around us. So I said, okay, uh, let me try something else. And again, whenever I do these, all these, these three particular things that I do, the energy, the readings always change from baseline from one to the other to the other. So the third one I tried was a frequency. I put out a couple of different frequencies. And again, no matter what frequency I used, the energy was just flatlined. It didn't make any kind of sense. Any kind of sense. There was no energy around us whatsoever. So then I changed my approach. I said, okay, let's set up the camera equipment. I had three cameras. I had a thermal imager, a full spectrum, and an IR camera, an infrared camera. And what I did was I started filming in all three spectrums of light, and I would turn the cameras around from one to the other. But the crazy thing about it is that it didn't matter what spectrum of light I was filming in. I couldn't see any of the glow sticks that were out there lit up. They should have shown up on one or two of of the cameras. We should have been able to see the glow sticks on the full spectrum and the infrared for sure, but they weren't showing up. And then at one point, the glow stick on my cousin's right, he think there was a pink glow stick to his right, started moving. It would go up, it would go down, it would go left, it would go right. And, you know, he tapped me on the shoulder and say, yo, cuz, are you seeing this? And I'm like, yeah. And I tried to film it with my cameras, but my cameras wouldn't film. I was seeing nothing on any of the cameras that I was using. He actually filmed one of the glow sticks moving with his cell phone. Don't ask me why his cell phone was able to pick the glow stick up moving and my high tech equipment wasn't. But we do got video of one of the glow sticks moving. And then we would turn on our headlamps. And when we turn on the headlamps, the glow sticks would be stopped. So I would say, let's walk over because I know where I placed it down. And let's see if it's in the same exact location. And we'd go over and we'd look. And sure enough, that glow stick would be exactly where I put it. How something was moving it around and then putting it back in the same location was beyond me. Now the glow sticks start moving all around us. There's one at the far end, the north end. Uh, it was like a blue glow stick at the north end that was moving, and it was doing figure eights. And again, we'd put the headlamp on, and it would stop moving. We'd shut the headlamp off, and it would start again. We'd get up and walk over there with the headlamps off. And it would move right up until we got within five feet of it, and then it would stop moving. We put our headlamps on, it would stop moving. But they were always back at the same location. It didn't make any sense how you could put something back down at the same location. And then it was happening to a glow stick on my a green one on my left started moving. So we called the psychic Cindy and we talked to Cindy and she said, 
she was seeing what she thought were fairies moving the glow sticks. But she believed that they really weren't fairies, that, that they were um, trickster entities from a different realm. And she said they're showing themselves to her as a fairy, but she doesn't believe that they're fairies because the energy was different than what she usually feels when she sees fairies. So she said, again, she, she warned us about this large creature that was going to come in and, and uh, observe us. And she said, be very, very careful with this thing because it's dangerous. So we were like, okay, we'll see what happens. You know, we'll, we'll take it one thing at a time. And um, at one point, we're sitting there. We're sitting there, and um, we're looking, just paying attention. And my cousin has um, a barapolic, a barapolic mic going, and he hears what sounds like a train whistle. Now, this train whistle, I can hear it without the barapolic mic, but I... But I hear this train. He hears a train like it's right on top of him. And he turns to me and he says, is there a train track around here? And I said, yes, there's a track about five miles away, but nothing runs on that track. And he goes, well, how do you know that there's no trains on that track? And I said, because I went to the sheriff's department. Because there's a location off of that track that I want to investigate. And the only way to get to that location is via those tracks. You can't drive there. You can't walk there. from. The, it has to be through the woods. So I went to the sheriff's department and I asked them, I said, do you, I may believe that I would just moved up to the area. And I said, do you think it's safe for children on school buses to go over these tracks without any crossing arms to come down and I, you know, my children ride the bus and I gave him this big spiel and the sheriff looked at me and laughed and said, there hasn't been a train on that track in 35 years. I said, okay, fine. Now I know I can use those tracks to get to the location I want to go to. So I explained this to my, my cousin and he's like, okay, so then why are we here in trains? And the ghost train came by not once, not twice, but three times. So we were a little, um, taken back by hearing the ghost train. Now, at this point, it's dark out. It's very, very dark out. And the helicopter comes back. And again, it's hovering above us. You can feel the percussion of the blades blowing up the leaf litter on the ground. That's how close it is to us. We can't see anything. We put our headlamps on. We put them in the spot position. They shoot 700 feet. And we look straight up into the sky and we don't see anything, but we feel it and we hear it. Okay. So that happens. So then we're sitting there and the helicopter leaves and we're sitting there. And my cousin turns to me and he goes, what's up? And I go, what do you mean? He goes, you just tapped me on my shoulder. What do you, what do you want? I go, no, I didn't tap you on your shoulder. He goes, well, something just touched me on my shoulder. So I said, it wasn't me. The only thing I could think of was these, these tricks that are beings that are all around us playing with the glow sticks because the glow sticks continue to move. So at one point, we're sitting there, and I'm looking directly in front of me. I have a yellow glow stick about... 50 yards in front of me at the edge of the western ridge right down at the bottom of the ridge now this is this particular ridge is where the sasquatches usually come in from their home range that's on the other side of this ridge and i'm looking at this yellow glow stick and something doesn't look right to me but i can't figure it out and i'm looking at it and i'm looking at it and i don't know if it was the energy of the place that made me a little loopy but I was like, so I called my cousin over and I said, Sean, take a look at this yellow glow stick. What's, what's wrong with this image? And he looks at it and he starts laughing. He goes, are you kidding me? And I go, what? He goes, he goes, Al, there's three yellow glow sticks looking back at us. And I go, oh, wow, right. There's three. 
but there was only one yellow glow stick in the pack, in the color pack that I put out. And he goes, how could there be three yellow glow sticks looking at us when we, there's only one in the pack? And I said, I don't know. Let's get up and see what it is. So as we get up and we start walking towards this yellow, these three yellow glow sticks that we think are yellow glow sticks looking at us, we get about 25 yards towards it and two of the yellow glow sticks blink. And we both stop dead in our tracks because now we know that two of them are not glow sticks. And we, he looks at me and I look at him and he says, well, what do you think it is? And to the best of my knowledge, the only thing cryptid that I know of that has yellow eyes are dogmen. And I've never, ever experienced a dogman at the sacred site. I know that's a Sasquatch site. And I go, I don't know what it is. And then we take another two, three steps forward and this thing starts to stand up and it stands up and it stands up and it stands up and these yellow eyes are getting higher and higher. And I know you got to remember it's 1% of the moon out that night. It's dark. So we put our headlamps on in the flood position so we could light up as much as the area as we could see. And there standing in front of us is a 10 foot creature that I can only describe as a gugway. I don't ever believe I've ever taken any reports of gugways in the Northeast. Uh, the Native Americans that I associate with the Iroquois Indians, they don't speak of gugways. And this thing stands straight up and it turns and it starts to run away from us. And maybe 50 yards to our north is a four foot stone wall. And this creature leaps over the wall and it just takes down tree after tree after tree. And it was like a bulldozer going through the woods. So my cousin and I, we go back to the base camp and we're sitting there. And we're, we're, we were discussing what happened. And he says, maybe we should go now, <laughs> you know? And I was like, let's call Cindy the psychic, see what she says. So we call Cindy and we tell her what we just experienced. And she told us, she goes, well, thank God that you were still in the sacred site. She says, what I can see is that you guys are in like, she said, she said it, it looked like we were in a glass dome and this creature was on the other side of that dome. Even though we had put the glow sticks where it was sitting some way, somehow, I don't know. We were in this protective glass dome and apparently it couldn't come into that dome area and it ran from us. She goes, thank God it ran from you and didn't attack you because I told you guys you were going to see something like this. And again, she called it a bear squash. She said it had like a bear's head with a snout. And she said, this thing is very, very dangerous. It's from a different realm. And, you know, you guys are just lucky that you were inside that dome. I don't know. I mean, we both felt like we were inside an enclosed glass dome. We both felt that we were surrounded by a black void. I couldn't get any of my instruments to get any kind of readings whatsoever. So she says, you guys should leave. I said, okay. Still pretty early in the evening. It's only like 11 o'clock. It's not really that late. And I don't usually leave that early when I'm having this much activity. But again, it's my cousin's first time out, and I got to think of him. So I said, okay, let's leave. I don't want to put him in harm's way. So as we're leaving, we're walking along the Appalachian Trail, and this part of the trail is like a goat trail. It's very, very sketchy, very rocky, very dangerous. Um, there's a lot of water on the rocks because of all the rain we've had here in New York State over the summer, and there's still water dripping down off the mountain over the rocks. 
And we get to a section of the lake where pretty wide open where we are. And we hear a giant splash hit the water. I mean, we turn, we have our headlamps on because we're walking. We turn to where we hear the splash and we see what looks like a 25 foot wave go straight up in the air, a rock, like something, a rock, a giant rock has just been thrown into the lake and it made this giant splash that went up 25 feet. And my cousin looks at me and his eyes are big as saucers. And he's like, what was that? And I know it sounds ridiculous, but I said, don't worry about it. It was just the beaver. And he made a splash with his tail. And, you know, we probably just scared him. He was probably on the rock or something. And we scared a beaver into the water and it splashed. And he goes, a beaver? I go, yeah, beaver. So he looked at me like he wasn't buying it, but I didn't want to scare him any more than he already was, you know, because this is all new to him. And we walk again and we walk maybe another quarter of a mile, a third of a mile, not really sure. Again, we're still on the sketchy part of the Appalachian Trail along the lake. And we hear another rock hit the water, bada boom. And again, we turn around and we see a splash that goes up 25 feet. And he looks at me and he says, another beaver? And I start laughing hysterical. I go, yeah, another beaver. He's like, yeah, another beaver. Okay, cuz. And we're walking. And we finally get off the Appalachian Trail and we get onto the mining road. And we're hiking out. And we usually we break on the hike because it is a four-mile hike. But I know there's a ranger station at the front of this trail. And they usually come to the lake around 11 to, to their last night patrol and i don't want to be caught at the lake just sitting there resting because they'll arrest you because you're not supposed to be at the lake at night so i said let's just keep hiking and if we run into the ranger you know let me do all the talking so he says okay so we're hiking and we're hiking and we're hiking and again you know we're getting closer to civilization we're on a mining road now but the woods are devoid of life and it's pitch black and my cousin swears that he feels something is following us out now normally when the sasquatches want us to leave they'll let us know and they'll hurt us to a certain location and they'll stop and turn around but we were past that turnaround location way past it i would say a mile and a half past that turn so i don't think Whatever was following us was a Sasquatch. So now we come to the ranger station and I tell them, okay, listen, we're not going to be able to get past the station without the ranger coming out. Let me do all the talking. I take a can of hairspray that I always carry with me and I spray it over here and I say, see, there's a visible infrared light that goes out and I spray it and I show them. I said, when we walk past this light, the bell is going to ring in the station. The dogs are going to bark. The ranger's truck is parked in front of the building. I said, the ranger's going to come out and question us. And then we're going to walk about 10 feet. And that sensor light is going to go off. And that's when he's going to come out when we're in that light so he can see us. I said, let me do all the talking. So he says, okay. So we walk through the invisible eye. Dogs never start barking. We stop. We wait. We don't hear any dogs barking. So that's strange. I've went past this station a hundred times and every single time this is exactly what happens so we walk past it dogs don't start barking we put, walk past the light that has the sensor on it that usually goes on the light doesn't come on the ranger doesn't come out we walk maybe a quarter of a mile to get to the main road we still have like another half a mile walk up the main road to get to our car and we get to the main road and i said okay now let's stop we're off the property the still park property we'll stop here have some water drink our, out of our canteens and take a break because we still got another half a mile hike uphill as we're sitting there drinking our water the light comes on from the light sensor there's nobody in there unless an animal ran past that light sensor that made it go off, but the sensor is up pretty high, like around the five foot height. You know what I mean? So smaller animals don't set it off. 
And we just look at each other and we start laughing like, I don't believe we got past the ranger station. And the light is like on a five minute delay. We hike up to the car. We unload everything. We start discussing everything. I said, let's listen to the digital voice recorder that we had going that was actually working that night. Um, let's listen to it. Let's see. We're going to get the whoops from the Sasquatch. We're going to get the trains. And through the three times the train went by. And we're definitely going to get the helicopter both times. And we go to play it. And it comes up. Error corrupted audio file now i don't know if the helicopter had something to do with corrupting that file but there should have been all three on that recorder and there was nothing absolutely nothing and he looked at me and he said how is that possible and i said the only way that is possible is if that helicopter zapped this recorder and screwed it up because i don't know this rec i've had this recorder for over a dozen years i've used it in a million different locations it's never failed me but i don't know and then, then my cousin looked at me and said beaver huh and i go well let me let me be honest with you of course it wasn't a beaver i said that was something on the other side of the lake throwing giant boulders into the water i said that wet east side of the lake is the dog man side I don't know if that was a dog, man, because we didn't see anything on the other side of the lake. You know, our headlamps went 700 feet, but that um, lake is a 52 acre lake. So we couldn't see what was on the on the cliff on the other side, throwing the rocks. But it was throwing the rocks closer to our side. So I don't know how strong it had to be to throw the rock that far across the lake. But whatever these rocks were, they were big. And he, my cousin said, do you think there's something above us throwing rocks into the lake? He actually mentioned that. And we were in a clearing, you know, both times this happened, we were in a clearing and I was like, there's really nothing above us. I mean, it's just, it's just mountain. There's no cliffs where you can get, pull a giant rock off of uh, the cliff and throw it in or being able to be on a ledge to throw it over. So I said, I don't think it was coming from our side. I truly don't. And uh, that was the end of uh, October, Friday the 13th investigation. And we did go back two weeks later on October 28th. And uh, so to be continued. If you've had a paranormal experience and would like to be a guest on the show, please contact us by going to myparax.com. That's my para e x dot com. Thanks for listening.